two weeks of tariff negotiations. Uh, you know, everybody's you, in this poker game. Aren't you, could, you could move your factory someplace, and then uh, six weeks later, they could agree on lifting the tariffs. So it's a very, very difficult situation for businesses. It says the tariffs reduced the company's 2018 profits by 5 to 8%. In dollar terms, we're talking about 90 to $100 million, about 15% of annual profits. So you yeah. could see why a company, right. if you thought that you could preserve that right. $100 million-ish uh, amount of money, what, and it's 15% of your earnings. Right. I mean, that's yeah. that's significant. And it may also uh, be an excuse for uh, um, Harley-Davidson to leave. They, they may have, they have uh, always uh, built themselves as kind of a, a, a patriotic uh, company staying here, and, and even though it may not have been in their short-run best interest, so this may be an excuse for them to do what they would like to have done anyway. Yeah. Well, again, it's probably, you know, like you say, um, just the, the, the way it seems like Donald Trump likes to run the game and negotiate is to really kind of right. throw a lot of stuff out there, get people really rattled. But, but He's really right. good at getting people rattled. Right. But if I, if I were an American steel producer, I wouldn't necessarily want to reopen the plant based upon uh, some speculation about tariffs. I mean, Especially uh, with a guy that's as volatile. Right. right. So you never really know what you're going to get. Um, we're going to move on to, uh, should you manage your own investments? Um, you know, more and more people these days, uh, you know, are, are getting this message that, Hey, why not do it on your own? Who needs an advisor? And obviously we have a, a, a bias where, you know, we're, we're in the business of being financial advisors and, uh, but we've never promoted the idea that people shouldn't try to do it themselves in all fairness. We're, you know, we're, we're trying to, uh, Looks like we have a call. We'll get that in just one second. And uh, so we'll get back to this, but we're going to spend a little bit of time about a blog that Ryan, you wrote about do it yourself investing. And you were also quoted recently in advisor news about do it, you do it yourself investors as well. Uh, but f before we go to that, we're going to go to Brian on line one, Brian, good morning. Brian, are you there? Brian? Yeah, I'll try one more time. Brian, are you there? Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah. I have a question about uh, long-term care insurance. Yes, sir. I, I've had it for a few years, okay. and uh, this last year it went up 50%. Do you think that it's a good idea <clears throat> to have long-term care insurance? Uh, my wife and I are in our 60s now, and uh, it's went up to like a 1000 bucks a quarter, so it isn't cheap, but... Uh, What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, why don't we spend a little time talking about that? I don't mind derailing a little bit here because this is really on the top. This is between one of the biggest concerns retirees have is running out of money or really they ought to be thinking about, in essence, running out of their lifestyle, their ability to spend on the things they want and need to do in life. And, of course, one of the things that can derail that, I was just, and I might have sent it to you guys yesterday, I just read a really big study on health care and retirement, and it has a, a large section on long-term care. So here's the way we approach uh, long-term care insurance. We always recognize that there's a potential need for that. We know that about half the people won't need any long-term care, okay? And then you have to go to the other side that will need some long-term care, and then you have to get a sense of proportionality to it. So first we start trying to assess the odds. Now, when it's our life, it's only us. It's not this pool of people. We'll get to that. Uh, but the chances of somebody having a really large long-term care need are, are quite low, less than 20%, okay? But look, for a lot of people, a fifty or $75,000 long-term care need at the end can do a lot of damage. So how, do we, how are we going to address this? And I think people, almost everyone has a friend or a family member that has had that long extended stay in a nursing home or at least assisted living and then nursing home for a little while. And so I think that's fresh on their minds as they always see the worst case scenario as opposed to, you know, really recognizing that they're really more the exception than the rule, although it does happen. Yeah, there, there was a, a, a news that has a 50th anniversary uh, history, what happened uh, 50 years ago. And 50 years ago, it cost $250 a month to, to uh, stay in the Champaign County nursing home. <laughs> and inflation adjusted just conceptually is, is that, Part that of, was 50 years ago. Yeah. So what, four times higher? Yeah. In that, so uh maybe maybe a little bit higher but it certainly costs a lot more than that now now yeah. it's probably somewhere closer to six or seven thousand a month i'm guessing it, you know, maybe not that specific home but in illinois right. or in central illinois so what go ahead ryan and i was gonna say there's also a little bit of misconception and 
kind of shifting of the the data too because i think there's a stat that's out there it's like roughly 70 percent of sure. all people yeah. were going to have a need for long-term care right. in their lifetime which is which is true but when you dig into the data a lot of those people end up getting care at home by sure. the spouse and so that is lumped into that so it kind of feeds off of this fear of oh my gosh everybody needs this okay. care so now we're brian and his wife we're in our 60s and we're saying, look, one of us could easily live into our 90s. So we, one of us may answer the doorbell with a nine in front of our age. Um, let's talk about how we approach it. Virtually every client that walk. So we're in the retirement planning business. That's all we specialize in. So Brian, uh, this is one of the center issues when it comes to creating a uh, really a lifetime income plan that you can't outlive that will at minimum match your expenses over a two to three decade retirement recognizing that even if a potential client doesn't say it somewhere in the back of their mind, they're worried about this issue. So Dave, why don't you talk a little bit about how you would approach it? Uh, a, 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 someone in their low sixties, mid sixties, they come in they say, I have this long-term care policy. Where do you go from there? I think the first thing I look at is can they afford to self-insure? So let's just start there and see like, okay, can you actually afford to not have long-term care insurance? And although it wouldn't be ideal, say you have three, four years of nursing home expenses, you would get through it. Um, and then I guess there's always the backstop of, of Medicaid, going on Medicaid, spending down your assets. But most people don't want to do that right. because then you can't choose the facility you want. There's downsides to that. But I'll look at that first. And basically what I do is I come up with a pretty conservative assumption. And sometimes I'll, I'll get the client's input on this is, you know, how many years do you want us to have long-term care expenses? And then I know kind of the average costs around here. I know the historical inflation rates for long-term care expenses. And I see, okay, if we add that as a goal in the financial plan of, okay, we're going to have these additional expenses the last, you know, maybe three to five years of the plan, can they actually fund that? How much does it decrease their retirement spending versus just not having that goal in the plan? And once I know that answer, usually what I do is move to step two, which is, well, let's compare the spending reduction that's necessary to self-fund long-term care expenses to the price of just going out and purchasing a policy. And usually what I see is it's cheaper, a little bit cheaper to self-fund, um, but it, it's usually fairly close, I would right. say. So, Seems to be. And it, it really is a case-by-case -case basis. So it's really hard to give a blanket answer when someone says, hey, should I have long-term care insurance? It's like, well, it depends. What are you know? What's your net worth and your investment assets and resources? How much are you leaning on those resources right now? Basically, how much are you withdrawing from them? So you need There's to flush it out in the backdrop of a plan. What is it you're trying to do between now and that potential need? And does this get in the way of what it is? Because sometimes it gets in the way of we want to leave the kids some money too. Yeah. And so you flush that out of what happens if you don't have any? <clears throat> That's either going to show you whether you have a need and the extent of the need. And when you're doing that, you don't just, you know, when you hear the average cost is 80 or 90 or $100,000, you don't assume they need an extra 80 or 100,000. You, you net it against their other income, <coughs> certain things you won't be doing. You're not going to be traveling around the globe, et cetera. So a lot of times it's not as big of a financial issue as people think it is for most people. Right. And I think for, for Brian's sakes, maybe one more practical kind of I don't, wouldn't even call it advice, but perspective that I have is, you know, $4,000 a year for long-term care insurance sounds really reasonable to me. It's, I, it's not, I've seen to be a, the, policies. It seems to be kind of the going rate, where, even after adjustments that we're seeing right now. Right. Well, one way you might uh, save some money is to defer the activation date. If, if you don't have it kick in until six months or even longer, you can lower the premiums and most people can handle six months, uh, they may not, be, may not be able to handle five years. So you can get the insurance on the back end and, and save some of the, the costs. Right. I think that's, that's a good idea, Fred, because when I look at the statistics, and I really dove into them yesterday, it would look to me like for many, many people, well, for the majority of people, they're not going to have a really large uh, long-term care need. So then you start defining what is it that could hurt me. And that's, Dave, part, that's part of what you do in that analysis, saying, well, how big of a fear do you have? Uh, how likely do you think the event is? Because we have to play the probability. So, Brian, I think the thing to do uh, from a practical standpoint, so one, I think what the notice you, you've received, the increase in payments, kind of what we're seeing out there. Most of that, by the way, is a result of companies that issued these policies 
quite a number of years ago when interest rates were substantially higher than they were today and they got the lapse rate. How many people will lapse from this policy? They thought it would be about 5% a year. It turned out to be 1% to 2% a year. Because of those two significant issues, Brian, that's the reason you and countless of our clients have received these little nice gifts that say, look, you either cut your, you cut your uh, benefit in half or we need to double your premium, yeah. make a choice. And then when we do is we say, look, now that we have this new information, so you have a financial advisor that should easily be able to take two scenarios, Brian. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, you're going to have to, you know, divulge some financial information for them to really make that decision or help you make that decision. It really ought to be approached as giving you the information to make that decision. The answer usually kind of is pretty obvious when you do that. So here's what it looks like if you keep the policy. Here's what your standard of living uh, is. And if you want to basically be able to ensure that same risk, but do it on your own, in other words, you're just going to spend less and you're going to earmark money essentially for a long-term care need. And then you can price. Once you get to those two, it's sometimes Dave it's a, uh, and Ryan, it's an attitude issue. Yeah. Some people, Brian, even if we could show them that you could self-insure for, in a, in a particular case, for substantially less money, uh, you know, a reasonable risk. Uh, the client cannot retire peacefully without having that actual insurance policy. So at some point it becomes an attitude issue and not just a financial one. I don't think you can do it in a silo, Brian. <clears throat> I think anybody that tells you to keep it or sell it just on its face is probably doing you a disservice. So therefore it requires a little more work from a financial advisor to say, here's what your life in scenario one looks like with it. Here's what it looks like without it or some combination of the two. There, and as Fred there, said, change some benefit uh, levels. There may be some more bad news too. Uh, in my case, there was an increase, but it was phased in over uh, three or four years. So the first year may not be the end of the, the bad news. As you, so you should check about this situation. The, this is the risk of owning these insurance policies. Even these hybrid policies that we're <clears throat> reading about quite a bit, you give insurance company $200,000 and they'll give you $400,000 of life insurance. And if, and if you need long-term care, you can spend tons of money. The risk in those are there's really no stated rate of interest on them. So even if interest rates or when interest rates normalize, the insurance company could pay you zero or 1% interest rate. And you're essentially paying a much higher premium just by earning. So there's no real magic here, Brian. You are amongst many folks with the long-term care dilemma of getting that nice notice in the mail. I would find a qualified advisor. Uh, you might even be able to find a, a, a good CPA that could just pay buy an hour of his time and try to get his or her advice and try to run a couple of scenarios. You want someone who's very familiar with financial modeling in these areas. That's what I would do. And I would add to that, hopefully a fee only advisor, just because if you go to someone who sells long-term care insurance, I mean, there's definitely a big conflict there. Not saying that that's necessarily going to cause them to give inappropriate advice, but it's just something, I, if it was me, I would go to someone who doesn't really have kind of like a, an ax to grind. It's a conflict you can avoid. So right. uh, what we're just saying is, look, at least understand the conflicts there if you do uh, go get advice from someone who either sold you the policy right. or may want to sell you another policy. It doesn't make them evil. It just makes that conflict real. Yes, Brian. What worries me is... Uh... They could raise my rates at any time. Of course. And, uh, you know, of course, all insurance is a bad deal unless you use it, right? Well, right. I mean, we hope our house doesn't burn, but yet we have insurance in case the house burns down. Right. So, but long-term care is a little different because now we're talking about potentially eating materially into a retiree's lifestyle. And uh, I think if, Brian, I think it would be very settling in your mind and you could put the issue to rest until you get another letter if you do. And if you would do that uh, and, and hire a qualified person to do that analysis for you, I think it will increase your sleep between one and three in the morning is my guess. <laughs> well, this policy uh, covers me and my wife. And if one of us starts using it, the other, the premium cease. And it also has a <clears throat> in-home uh, care uh part to it and also uh, the premiums waived if one of us starts using it okay so. well those are you sounds like you have a pretty good policy uh mm -hmm. with a lot of benefits that somebody might naturally want to have uh, another option to 
consider is if you get to a point where you say, look, we can't afford both of us having this. Guys usually wake up on a cloud before women. Doesn't always happen that way. You have to look at your own circumstances and your own life. The way we typically run them, well, whether it's people agree or disagree, is we assume that one of the two people will have a somewhat significant long-term care need. It's usually the one we expect to live the longest. Let's just face it, if I can generalize with a broad brush, as I said, men need to, if they're going to need long-term care insurance, it's probably before their spouse. Then the, that guy wakes up on a cloud. You know, the spouse has worn themselves out taking care of the other spouse. Now there's nobody there to really help the second to die spouse or the second to need long-term care spouse. And so I think our strategy is pretty sensible. And it's kind of like trying to work within the probabilities and the odds, all these things and saying, what's a sensible strategy? One that allows us to sleep at night. Well, thank you for your input, and uh, I might be calling on you here one we'd of these be, days. We'd be happy to help. You're you're a, you're a good caller, not necessarily to our show, but I hear you on the uh, Penny for Your Thoughts show quite a bit, Brian. So, are I, you sure I, it's me? I'm pretty sure it's you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. All right, Brian. Thanks. All right, guys. Well, that was good. I, I think uh, really Brian brought up uh, Fred. Uh, this is probably. Um, I don't know how, and it's none of my business, how you're personally dealing with that um, uh, issue, but you certainly have feelings and thoughts about it as an economist. As you can see the dilemma people face when they right. think they're taken care of, and then they literally get their premiums doubled in one letter. Yeah, and you buy insurance for a certainty, and this is, and again, I, I, I felt sort of uh, misused because uh, I was paying the premiums all these years when I had a uh, was younger and had a very low probability of needing right, it. Right. Now, now that I'm getting closer to uh, the potential need, then they raised the premium. So it wasn't a pleasant thing, but I understand that. And there's very few companies left in the business. Yeah. Uh, well, most, many companies, I don't know if it's most, but many companies, if not most, have left that business because it's just one hard to actually, well, I just think they did a poor actuarial job. I just think it was unforgivable to, to the, for a major company, not to have someone who's the chief probability officer that can say, oh, wait a minute, we, we, this is uncertainty we're trying to deal with. Well, it's not even uncertainty, it's risk. Uncertainty is when you don't even know the distribution well, they got of hit. outcomes. <clears throat> they actually got hit two ways. One was uh, longevity increases. The other was uh, a much faster than the expected raise, rise in the uh, cost of home, uh, long-term care. So I think they missed So, so, so it's really four things, okay? So they, most of these pol many of these policies that got really big premium increases uh, came out when interest rates were much higher and now they're lower. So that's tough on insurance companies, but that's modelable. They, that, they mm -hmm. can model that. Okay. Uh, the lapsing rate. So when you think 5%, so one out of 20 people will quit paying their premiums any given year to the insurance company. That's great. We got some of their premiums. Now we don't have to take care of them. So they're helping the pool. So you're throwing in two that are very sensible that saying on top of that, uh, the cost of healthcare increased at an increasing rate right right and then uh the some longevity and then the longevity uh it just in the last 15 <clears throat> years has probably gone up i don't know maybe a year or so uh it, it's all these combinations but brian is like a lot of people that walk through our door and i i can tell people this um i'm just going to be frank about it uh once you have the analysis done whether you like it or not, at least it's kind of a settled issue with you. It's like, oh, gosh, we're going to have to keep paying the premiums or, hey, we don't. But it's still going to cost us maybe as much to earmark money. I thought an interesting uh, number from a Vanguard study. I'll, I'll try to bring it in next time so I can actually cite it. Uh, but the number stuck out to me because they were talking about the average. And when you start looking at averages, it really kind of messes things up. But they felt like for most people, you would have to put $70,000 away in an investment pool to deal with the typical long-term care needs. So that's kind of, when you think about that, uh, sounds about right because suppose you can spend 5% on $70,000. So if $70,000 in a balanced portfolio, maybe you can spend four or 5%. I'm going to use 5%. It's about $3,500 a year you're foregoing if you take that $70,000 bucket out of your life, you know, your bucket for living on. You're basically saying, I'm going to, uh, let's call it 3000 a year. I'm going to pay premiums in a sense by not having this money available. It's earmarked for something else. Uh, so it's really kind of a de facto 3000 to $3,500 uh, spend, the same as you're paying a premium. So that kind of all stacks up to me. So if someone said, what would I need to put away for 
if I'm looking at broad <clears> rush <throat> averages, I'd say oh, seventy or eighty thousand dollars just funded over there in a bucket, probably going to take care of most people. It may not take care of you if you're if you have Alzheimer's and all that. Obviously, it's not. Uh, those are the scenarios that are very difficult to even insure against sometimes. So I'm going to get back, guys. Uh, again, you can call us 356-9397. And you can text us at 351-5357 on the Castle Heating and Cooling text line. We're always delighted to uh, have your texts. Seems like we get a lot more texts uh, than phone calls lately because I think it's, I know I like to do that myself. So we were talking about a blog Ryan wrote on do-it-yourself investing. He was also quoted in Advisor News about do uh, about do it yourself DIY. So I got a little confused there. Investors as well, um, and you were part of a list. Of the why are the reasons maybe you don't want to go about it on a do it yourself investment? The first one I think is really important. Do you have the expertise? So these are the questions you really need to think about. Uh, do you have the expertise uh, to do that? So Ryan, why don't you uh, you know give me your spin on that? Sure. And, and I think it's kind of helpful to preempt too. It's, it's not that you couldn't get the expertise. You could probably do it, uh, but maybe your time is better served elsewhere. Like if you're retired, maybe you want to enjoy your retirement rather than spending that time in investment management and uh, learning and educating yourself. But for a successful investment portfolio, it, it should really have three things you should be keeping in mind at, at all times. It should be low cost. Uh, it should be globally diversified. And it should be occasionally rebalanced as the market goes up and down and swings left and right. Uh, you want to make sure that you're monitoring that so that your portfolio is still aligned and tracking what your goals are. And as we talk about ad nauseum, you know, everything should be plan driven. And so just having a plan will help keep you in balance. But, well, yeah, and without a, you know, it, it not only a plan, you need to have a plan, you need to have a planner, you need somebody and uh, a guy that we respect, Carl Richards, uh, the behavior gap guy, uh, he's pretty interesting. His view is once you write a plan, it's already stale. You know, it's, it's a process of planning. Mm -hmm. And so everything's in the backdrop of the process of planning. Agreed. And, and one thing that you can't underscore, too, is if you're going the DIY route, uh, you have to consider that as financial advisors like we are, this is all we do. It's our profession. It's our expertise. Um, so there's likely the chance that you will have some errors made, not necessarily huge errors, but they could be that an advisor who is skilled would not allow you to make because they would have intervened before something would have happened. And these errors are, could trip you up all over the place. It could be in the form of, of a tax mistake where you could have put a certain type of investment in a more tax efficient account, like an IRA versus a Roth IRA. It could be making sure that you've pulled out your required minimum distributions on time so you don't receive the 50% penalty for what has not been withdrawn. So there's so much obviously involved that you wouldn't necessarily know without a full uh, education in this that you're leaving yourself open to decreasing the one retirement that you get in a negative way. Yeah, and of course that leads to the next one, which I always put is when someone says, you know, oh, do you think? you know, bad behavior from an investor standpoint is, is, is one of the big problems. I go, I didn't know there were any other problems in this, <laughs> uh, but it really gets down to, do you have the discipline? Do you have the temperament? Uh, <laughs> Bill Bernstein, who's written four or five bestsellers and probably one of the most brilliant people is a neurosurgeon. That's now a financial advisor uh, talks about this says, look, one of the four things you need is to be able to execute it. I'm going to quote him hell or high water, unquote. Uh, and I think that really gets to this temperament issue. Absolutely. And I think there's honestly two different versions of this. There's <clears throat> the one that everyone talks about is, you know, are you going to be able to stay invested when the market declines? And sometimes a lot. And for people who are accumulating money, I think it can be a little bit extra scary sometimes because you're probably, if you're really doing things properly, you should probably be primarily invested in equities or in the stock market. Well, you're going to have times, you know, over an entire lifetime where that gets cut in half. Um, and then retirees kind of have extra stress. Maybe their portfolio is a little more conservative and they have more fixed income. But now you're taking withdrawals when it goes down. And so not only is your portfolio balance declining just because of the market, but now we're withdrawing maybe another, you know, tens of thousands a year and bring it down even further. And that just adds an extra layer of stress. And Fred, right? look, um, you and I have been around here longer than these guys. You're a trained economist. Uh, one of the things people soon forget <clears throat> is 
that periodically, it seems like every decade or so, all the wheels fall off and all the things that were making us some decent money now are suddenly hurting right. us with a vengeance. Right. And people continue to be surprised by that. Right. Even though it's kind of built into the system. Yeah, but you, even though you, uh, you can tell people about it and have the so-called uh, lifeboat drill, it's hard, the real thing is uh, more, uh, more taxing and more... Uh, more um, Living it real time is, is, is more right. difficult. The other thing, which I'd also mention, uh, you might hope that, well, I'll do it myself and I'll, I'll accept advice from the uh, various financial firms around. Uh, but the problem is that they're not necessarily giving the, the same advice. For example, we talked a long time about the uh, advantages of using passive investments in either uh, uh, index funds or uh, exchange, exchange traded funds. And now there's a new way of, uh, of messing you up. And that is you can still invest in uh, low cost funds. Now they're encouraging you to shift from one fund to another, sure. depending on whether you think international or uh, value or whatever is going to be in, in, in uh, vogue. So it takes away the, uh, the, the kind of long-term planning you're talking about. So you can't necessarily rely upon a particular institution to. Uh, and, and I think what makes it hard uh, from a behavioral standpoint, I, I think about this all the time is issues like, uh, yes, you know, we'll shift from this sector to this sector or international U S all these things, or we'll time the market or we'll pick the right stocks. They, the, the, the argument that, that goes for that, you know, that, that has going for it is it sounds good. But the best argument about against trying to do those things is it doesn't work. Right. And uh, well, that's the, the typical ad you hear is uh, you've saved all this money, invested it, and you have a lot of money. And now sometime in the future, the market's going to go down. Therefore, you should do X, which is probably not uh, not hold the course. It's uh, uh, retreat in some way or another. And so I think that temperament issue is the issue. Obviously, it's, it's one, been one of my main themes since I've been doing this show for almost 30 years. Uh, it's how we behave during these periods that are going to happen. They're not predictable. It's not, the point is not to try to predict them. It's try to build into your long-term, your lifetime plan, the idea that these, th the wheels are going to come mm -hmm. off occasionally. Is that just built into economics, Fred? Just any system is, is it's impossible to have a system that goes up all the time and there's never a recession. Sure. Or even, uh, the, the hope was back uh, 60 or 70 years ago that we could smooth out the uh, business cycle. And to a certain extent, we have, but we haven't made it smooth. But the business cycle is uh, very, very smooth compared to the cycle of uh, asset prices. And, <laughs> and when we think about economics, too, when you go back to the yeah. late, the mid to late 1800s and maybe the first 25 years of the 1900s, yeah. I mean, <laughs> when things when things got bad, they yeah. got bad. I mean, it, it, yeah. it makes the recessions of today look like. They're well, nothing. and also, uh, if we were here 10 years ago, we'd say, well, we, we eliminated, uh, we'd have, have it smoothed out the uh, business cycle. We've eliminated these major catastrophic downturns, but it turned out that we, we hadn't. So, uh, yeah. the, again, uh, 2008 was very bad, but it wasn't the worst in history, and uh, it, it only happened rarely. So the hope is that won't you know, be another. Would it be fair to say, just in an opinion, not, not just, I, I frequently tell people, look, we get one of those type of situations in our lifetime, essentially, yeah. and you just got yours. Uh, from, an, from a historical perspective, would that sort of be true? It's true, but it's nothing you want to count on. You can have 200-year floods in two five years. Two, two years in a row, yeah. right? Uh, but again, it's unlikely, but it's not, uh, not a certainty at all. But what, what probably is a certainty is that the next crisis won't be the same as the last crisis. And it won't be what everybody expected it to. Right. We're, we're expected. Otherwise, we never know a, what the trigger is. It wouldn't right? be a crisis if you, uh, if you knew it was coming. So. And that's why there's never really a bubble. I mean, you don't right. know if you're in a yeah. bubble until it's after the fact. And there are periods of irrational exuberance yeah. for sure. Uh, but that recency bias is one of these things that works against not only do-it-yourself investors, even professional investors. I right. mean, everybody, you know. And the, the one thing that we always talk about, it, you could do it on a, a kind of uh, piecemeal basis by rebalancing. Rebalancing is a way of dealing with this, not perfectly, but at least uh, in the right direction. But that, but that goes against this temperament issue, yeah. right? So, uh, okay, so I always tell clients, look, you're in about eight different things in your portfolio. On any given year, you're gonna be mad at three of them and you're gonna love another three and two you're gonna be you know, neutral about. Something in that form. And I don't have a clue which one they're going to be. So it goes against that rebalancing thing. It's, yeah, you don't wanna put, you say, well, 
uh, this particular asset's done really well. Why not put more money into it? Of course. It? You're but, saying, wait a minute, the, Paul or Dave or Ryan, you're telling me to, you know, take less money and put, put less money in the stock market and putting more money into bonds to rebalance but the bonds haven't produced much of a return over the last 10 years. Why would any rational person want to do that? It could be the same thing with, okay, we're going to shift, not shift to shift, that it's become out of balance. Now our international portion is too small relative to the U.S. portion. We're suggesting we rebalance. This isn't something we do every quarter or even necessarily every year when it's sensible to do it. But this works against that temperament issue because what are we telling them? We're going to be selling the things that you're happy about, that bring you joy, that bring you pleasure. And we're going to suggest that you take that money and put it into something over the last three years that has caused you pain and has caused you displeasure. And this, this I'm just convinced more and more that, again, the single handedly thing that makes it almost impossible. Bill Bernstein, who's like I said, he's a, this guy's probably one of the most well-respected people in finance and who no, pe most people never heard of, uh, you know, basically says there's basically a one out of 10,000 shot that you're a person that can do it on your own. And he based that on four different characteristics, which he thought each one had about a 10% probability of. And so to have all four of them would be, you know, one over 10 to the fourth power. So one in 10,000 people. This is really the essence of what makes do-it-yourself investing. Anybody can pick a portfolio. You can go to any uh, robo-advisor and have a, decent allocation in a low cost portfolio. A lot of these things, I think like robo advisors are bull market phenomena. I've seen this before bull market phenomena, things that are invented during bull markets only to send people really into a tailspin when they realize, Oh, the wheels do come off from time to time and not having somebody to talk to about it, not having someone to stare them right in the eyes and say, look, Mr. And Mrs. Smith, I understand that you want to end March of 2009 or the fall of 2008 want to sell all of your stocks. So that, because everybody on TV says, do it now while you still can save some money. But let me just tell you that will probably be the biggest financial mistake that you'll ever make in your life. And I'm going to suggest that you don't do that. And if you do want to do that, you need to tell me where to transfer your account because I won't be part of it. Yeah. It's that brick in the head that I think people need to deal with this temperament issue from time to time, not most of the time, occasionally. But the other uh, point about an advisor is that even if you can do it now, you may not be able to do it in 10 years or 20 years from now. Well, that was actually, Fred, without you even knowing it, that was the next thing of a concern about doing it yourself, investment, Dave. I think that was something you were going to talk about is you may, I deal with this every day. Look, I've been doing this for 35 years. I, 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 I'm not an expert on aging, but I'm seeing it right in front of my eyes. And I've seen the, the sea changes in clients from their late seventies into their mid eighties. Uh, that's one of the things that people need to think about, isn't it? Like, okay, you, you may be very well one of those people that can do it on your own. What about 10 years from now? Right. Or what about your spouse 10, 15 years from now, if you pass away, you know, we've actually gotten a couple clients that have just downright said like, look, I think I could probably just handle things on my own, but I kind of want continuity because, you know, maybe they were older than their spouse and they knew they were likely to pass away several years before their spouse. My spouse is not interested in finance, doesn't really know what she's doing. And does I don't want her to have to try to figure this out on her own and kind of just be thrown to the wolves if something happens to me. So they specifically chose to hire us now just so that, you know, we can handle things when they're gone. And I think that's kind of an interesting uh, reason to hire an advisor that I never would have thought of before get, getting into the industry, but we legitimately have two or three clients that have said that exact thing. Yeah. I've had, uh, I, I had a, a situation where a, a guy's wife didn't even know he was, had terminal illness and he came to me first. It wasn't a client. Someone, you know, came in from, I was going to say off the street, but that didn't sound very eloquent, but someone I didn't know. And he starts talking and he goes, look, here's the deal. And he explains to me, this is what's going on. And I'm not going to be around here much longer. And if this money, if my wife just has it, and this is not a male or female thing, I've seen it go both ways. Um, that money will be gone in less than a year. And I need someone to lay down the gauntlet and keep her from doing that. I mean, would you do that? I said, look, I'll do my best. There's really nothing legally I can do other than to be a mean Dutch uncle 
and try to do my best. And he hired us just for that reason. And I think that's a reasonable reason to think about hiring a financial advisor. I mean, look, it comes down to, it's a pretty simple issue. You know, it's who is going to shepherd your life savings in a way that is going to support you and your family in the ways that you want it to happen. And who's going to help you achieve all those financial objectives that you want to achieve? Are you going to do it yourself? You're going to hire somebody outside. Again, I've said it before, when we tell people to find an advisor, it's like a barber telling someone to get a haircut. They need a haircut. Um, but look, we make it easy on you. And there's a lot of good firms in this town. So this is not just to promote us. This is to promote uh, other, all the other financial advisors in town too, in a blanket sense. There's one or two knuckleheads I would probably exclude from the list. I'm not going to go into the list. Um, but we make it certainly easy on people. They can go to our website. They can call us. They can go to our website and schedule a 30 minute phone call, uh, at no cost. And, uh, we'll do it when it's convenient for you. That's the whole point. And sometimes people don't even want to come in and sit down for an hour, hour and a half and divulge a lot. Sometimes they want to go to the website, get to know a firm, get a feeling for the firm. And then make a phone call with, before they make a formal visit. Sometimes in that, in that first 30 minute or 15 minute phone call, you can find out if there's a fit or a need. And I think we're probably like most advisors. They don't want to waste the other person's time. I mean, they don't want to, we don't want to waste our time and su submit the fit where we really think if there's our rule is if we don't think we can have a major impact on somebody's financial life, we don't take them on as a client for any fee. And, uh, and I, I think that's good. So, so it really does get, there are a number of issues about doing it yourself. Uh, I'm going to kind of capsulize what Bill Bernstein wrote in his book, um, The Intelligent Asset Allocator. He said, I've come to the sad conclusion that only a tiny minority will ever succeed managing their own money even tolerably well. Successful investors need four abilities. Number one, an interest in the process. Number two, and let's face it, not everybody has an interest in the process. Number two, more than a bit of math horsepower, far beyond simple arithmetic and algebra, or even the ability to manipulate a spreadsheet. Mastering even the basics of investment theory requires an understanding of the laws of probability and working knowledge of statistics. I think that leaves a lot of people out. Number three, a firm grasp of financial history from the South Sea bubble to the Great Depression. And number four, which we've talked about, the emotional discipline to execute their plan strategy faithfully come hell or high water, or the apparent end of capitalism as we know it, where we were there in 2008, 2009, where it sure looked that way. He wrote on, I expect no more than 10% of the population passes muster on each of the above counts. This suggests that as few as one person in 10,000, 10% of the fourth power has the full uh, skill set. Uh, no matter how well an investor masters the theory of investing, he or she is lost if he or she lacks the ability to coolly observe extraordinary current events and say, I've seen this movie before. I know how it ends. I think if I had to encapsulate my whole value proposition or much of my value proposition with the 62 year old couple that walks in facing 30 years of rising uh, spending costs is I've seen the movie so many times. I don't, you know, I know Rocky loses uh, Rocky one. I don't, I don't go to Rocky and <laughs> the first Rocky movie expect it to be different. Uh, and I think there's a real value in that. I, I don't know what you guys fit in on that. And I think for the people who are more interested in managing their own investments, that's a good list of things for them to be aware of that they need to educate themselves on to make sure that they can actually manage things effectively on their own. You know, I don't think this is, we intend this to be a sales pitch necessarily. Right. It's just saying like, hey, if you're going to attempt to be a do-it-yourself investor, here's, be realistic. Some, here's some things to think about. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point. I, I, I feel a little bit like this was marketing, and I didn't I didn't intend it to yeah. be, but it certainly yeah. probably came off that way. Well, you have to accept, think, yeah, you have to accept uh, someone's uh, assertion. So if you accept the idea that uh, uh, low cost passive investments the best way to go, and having a broad based thing, you don't have to understand the uh, the uh, economics and the finance behind it as long as you believe that. Then it becomes a behavioral issue and the ability to make sure that okay. I've always said building an investment portfolio is easy. It should be free. Yeah. It's aligning it with what it is you want to have happen. And that's going to change by the way, just the market misbehavior itself periodically is going to say, you got to make a change here. Okay. Not a change just to make a change just to say, to keep it aligned with your plan. Uh, you don't need to take on this much fluctuation. Now you can reduce it. Uh, I think the real dilemma guys for people is, so we get on here and tell people, uh, 
make sure you're going into, if you're going to do it yourself, make sure that you understand what it is that you don't know. Mm -hmm. Make sure what, uh, what we think or what other really well-respected people think about the four characteristics that it takes. And you have to assess that. And they say, yes, but how many disaster stories have you heard about knucklehead financial advisors who aren't exactly the most trusted yep. people on the planet of earth? Uh, say, well, it's a lie. At least I won't purposely, uh, I was going to say a naughty word, sort of, I'm not going to, uh, I, I, pro I won't pr damage myself purposely for the benefit of, you know, somebody else, at least I, as the individual, to the extent I can, am I going, I'm going to operate in my own best interest. And this really all circles back to the department of labor. They drop their best interest mandate, uh, for, you know, brokers and financial advisors. And now the sec is taking it up that this is the paradox here. It, I think any even independent retired knowledgeable investment person would suggest most people don't try to created it, 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 this isn't about creating an investment portfolio it's about creating a, a lifetime financial plan uh do it on their own uh on the other hand anybody who's retired uh, from the business and didn't have an axe ground would probably say well i don't know how likely it is that uh, that most advisors would do any better if not worse this is the paradox here and i don't know how to solve that one of the things we can do is have the sec step in and have an actual robust best interest uh, fiduciary rule for anybody who's advising anybody on investing. That's true. And, an, and another thing that you can do is you can rely on outside organizations to somewhat kind of form a impromptu uh, police type, type group. And what we've subscribed to is the certified financial planner or the CFP model, which requires anybody who goes through this educational proxy, process and actually obtains the degree to be a fiduciary to their clients as are all registered investment advisory firms. But it it puts another layer of control in place that is a outward sign to the public. Uh, this is a advisor or an advising firm that subscribes to higher standards that they don't necessarily have to. I think that makes sense. I, you know, where there's so much confusion, everybody, whether you're, you're working for a brokerage firm, they all call themselves financial advisors, even though the brokerage industry tries to suggest that they don't, they're just brokers. Uh, you know, you can't have it both ways. I, I just think that the, probably the, 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 best question you can ask a potential financial advisor there's there's many of them but i i don't think they'd get through my filter is are you put willing to put in writing that you will act in my best interest as a fiduciary which means that by law you will do that people that say no don't and it and and i promise it doesn't i'm, I'm not saying that people that will not sign that are intend to harm you in any fashion. I'm just saying you can eliminate at least that layer of concern right out of the gate. One simple question. Will you act as my fiduciary agreeing to put my best interest first and ahead of you and ahead of your firms? And will you disclose any conflicts of interest that cannot be eliminated? And will you disclose every single aspect of the cost of doing business with you and creating such a lifelong plan. I think if you can get those three things, the first one, you get through that one, and then you want to ask the other two. The other two probably come easy if the person says yes on the first one, but it's going to be natural that they give you the second one. So that's kind of my thought on that. That it's, it, I was, When we were talking about doing this do-it-yourself investing, this little voice on this shoulder said, yeah, but I'm not so sure that I would go to a lot of financial advisors uh, and trust that. So uh, anyway, guys, we're about out of time. Well, Dr. Fred, thanks for uh, joining us on the show. We Good got here. travel coming up. Uh, not for a while. <laughs> oh, that's unusual for you, Fred. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be back in a couple of weeks when we get back from vacation. And we'll see you second Tuesday of July. I think that's the 9th or 10th. So thanks for listening to Paul Rudy's On The Money. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Thanks for listening. Join us for the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for Paul Rudy's On The Money.